Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, 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 my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship Sing like never before 
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years in Good morning. This morning we are going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 through 16. It's on page 967 of your Pew Bible. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I had made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So, although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boasts I made in him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his affection for you is even greater, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Pastor Eddie. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we come before you and we thank you so much for this morning uh, to be gathered together and to worship you, just to praise you for all that you are, uh, to recognize you in all your divine attributes. You are the God of love. We just love us. You love us with a love that is beyond understanding. It is incomprehensible. It's unfathomable. 
your mercy, your grace, that you just continually just pour upon us day after day. We deserve nothing, and yet you give us everything through your beloved Son who paid for our sins. We stand in awe of your holiness. You are the righteous one. You are set apart infinitely different than us, Lord, in all degree, in all degrees. And yet you allow us to approach you. We come before you to recognize your justice, your wrath. Oh, all who opposed you, Lord, and, and, and their end is something that we cannot not even process. All that you are, Lord, we come before you again to worship you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for having the opportunity to be able to grow in the depth and the knowledge of who you are, to learn at a greater scale, a greater scope of who we are, Lord, which in turn just allows us to worship you even with greater clarity. And I pray, Holy Spirit, this morning you will illuminate the text. Allow, take me out of it, Lord, and just allow your text to speak, your words to speak through your beloved apostle. And uh, just all that he wrote to this church, and there's so much we can glean from it, and we're just so thankful for his words and what they teach. We give you this morning. We praise you. Thank you. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. If you have your Bible, please turn with me. We're, we're working our way through. We're, I think we've been, uh, what, about four months in Second Corinthians, and we are now officially halfway. So we are working our way through it pretty quickly. Um, we're taking a big chunk today, and as I was studying through this, I quickly uh, realized that there's no way I can make it through this entire chapter. So I cut the back section of it off. Uh, just to be able to hit the main points of what I wanted to hit this morning. But yes, we are in 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verse 2 through 12. The greater context of it is 2 through 16, but we're just going to keep it to 2 through 12 this morning and look at what is in that portion. But for those of you who know me well, you know that one of my great heroes of the faith um, is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He preached from the pulpit of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London during the mid-1800s, and uh, he had an incredible ministry. He wrote several books. Uh, again, one of my favorite books that he wrote is about this thick, and it's called Lectures to My Students, and it was for his seminary students, and it is really punchy. It is to the point of what it looks like to be in the ministry and even within his church, on any given Sunday at the tabernacle, he would have over 5,000 in attendance, people standing in the back, people even standing outside, just hoping to hear him preach, to hear the word of God spoken from his pulpit. And from all human accounts, if you look at his ministry overall, he had so much to be joyful about. And Spurgeon was a joyful man. He was a happy guy. But he was also a man filled with deep sorrow. And believe it or not, Spurgeon, he battled depression on several accounts, several times throughout his ministry. Matter of fact, on Sunday morning in 1866, he entered his pulpit and gave this announcement. He says, I am the subject of depressions of the spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever gets to such extremes of wretchedness as low or as I go, I go to. Now, for some who knew Spurgeon, these words would seem kind of just, just incomprehensible. How could Spurgeon, who had such a beautiful, just a vast ministry, how could he suffer like this? How could he go through such turmoil within his soul? How could such a renowned theologian and pastor know the valley of despair. Yet the truth was, depression was a regular part of his life. Because 21 years later, in 1887, he said from the same pulpit these words. He said, personally, I have often passed through this dark valley. But understand, Spurgeon wasn't alone. Other great pastors, such as John Henry Joet of the Fifth Presbyterian in New York City wrote to a friend in 1920, and this is what he wrote. He says, you seem to imagine that I have no ups and downs, but just a level and lofty stretch of spiritual attainment with unbroken joy and equanimity. By no means 
I am often perfectly wretched, and everything appears most murky. Matter of fact, history tells us that Martin Luther, the great reformer, he went through intense fits of darkness. He would hide himself days on end because of just the heaviness of his heart and the burdens which he faced. Matter of fact, he would even go as far as hiding home implements within the kitchen and other places so that he wouldn't harm himself. One of these times, his wife, Katharina, entered his room dressed in solid black, which were her morning clothes. And startled by her appearance, Luther asked who had died, and she replied that no one had died, but by the way that he was acting, she thought that God had died. But the truth is, these sorrowful pastors, they are not outliers by any stretch. Matter of fact, a recent LifeWay poll asking pastors who shepherd, again, solid evangelical churches. These are good gospel-preaching churches that were surveyed. They were asked about the stresses of ministry and their attitude concerning depression. And the results are quite telling. Matter of fact, it came back that 20%, one in five pastors, are currently dealing with severe depression in the ministry. One in five. You see, history teaches us the reality that even godly believers get depressed. Those who have set their minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, understand, they are not immune. They are not exempted from these down times. Not by any stretch. Those who have gone for it all, who have scaled the highest mountain peaks, higher than most of us will ever attain. Well, sometimes these men were subject, subjected to depression and despair, the damp of hell, as one would put it, or as John Don called it, the common cold of the soul, for sooner or later, most people catch it. And God's servants, again, they are not immune. Depression actually has an apostolic precedent as the Apostle Paul experienced and fought against this great enemy more than once. Matter of fact, we're told in verse 6 of the passage before us this morning that Paul gives a self-description that he was downcast. Matter of fact, it's derived from the Greek word tapinos. Tapinos literally means he was going through depression. He was depressed. And Paul understood why he was feeling the way that he did. Look at verse 5. He says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. Now, to understand everything that Paul is going to tell us in this passage, to understand the full, broader context of everything that he has written to us, We have to go back and we need to remember the history. We need to look at the historical context of this. Otherwise, it's not going to make a lot of sense. And not just this letter, but we need to go back to the context of the entire formation of this church and where he has been from the very beginning here in Corinth. You see, the Apostle Paul is the one who established this church during his second missionary journey. He preached the gospel to men and women throughout the city, Jews and Gentiles alike. Many came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through his faithful ministry, the church of God at Corinth, it was established. It began to thrive. People were coming in from all over the place. They were being redeemed, saved from their pagan lifestyles that they once lived. And we're told that Paul, he stayed in this city for roughly 18 months just to ensure that it was fully established, that everything was going smoothly. He established pastors, elders, leaders to guide, to watch over this church. But then he had to leave, continue on establishing churches in other provinces, other places. And Corinth slowly began to drift. It drifted away from Christ, back towards paganism. It went back to the former way of life, or I should say many within the church, began to drift back to their former way of life. Sexual immorality, promiscuity, idolatry, factions and disunity, they began to just pop up within this congregation. 
And Paul, he got wind of this. He got word, so he wrote them a letter. And we're not sure, theologians-wise, as far as we're not sure what was in this letter because we no longer have it. But what we do know is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, which is alluding to this first letter, and he tells them not to associate with immoral men. He says, stay clear. Get these people out of the congregation. Don't mess with them. Get them out before they really do a work on the church. And though we no longer have this letter, it appears that Paul's first initial letter to the Corinthian church, it did little to, to squash these adversaries, to, to stop these false doctrines and, and these pagan practices from continuing on. Matter of fact, it looks like these divisions became deeper as the church continued on. The misuse of spiritual gifts became more rampant. The sins more intense, sexual immorality, envy, greed, you name it. They continued to drift further and further away from the gospel. So Paul wrote them a second letter. And we do have this letter. It's 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've read 1 Corinthians, you would hope that this would get their attention, that it would do the job to get them to repent because it is pretty, pretty pointed as far as what Paul says to them within it. However, the result of this letter was not that things became better, but they continued to get worse. So Paul, he said, okay, it's time for me to make a personal visit. So Paul then, he went and he visited the church of Corinth, hoping, hoping that his visit, his personal uh, presence there, would shake them a little bit to realize, okay, hey, we need to recage, we need to get back on track. So Paul entered Corinth, he went to the church, he expected a warm reception, but that is further from, further from the truth from what he received. Matter of fact, as soon as he, re he came into the church, he was actually opposed by people who he thought would love him and bring him in. And he tried to get this church back on track, but they wanted none of it. And he was only there a very short time. And seeing that he was going nowhere, he just left. He was hurt. Listen. He thought that they would rejoice seeing him, that they would heed his instruction, that they would come to their senses, get their affairs in orders. But instead of embracing Paul, there were many in the church, they sided with these false teachers. They ridiculed him. They rejected him. Now, if you're a pastor, would this hurt? Absolutely. This is a church he established on the gospel. So he left early. And after leaving this church, he then made his way towards Ephesus, where he wrote them a third letter, and this was known as the severe letter. We do not have it. Possibly it's at the end of 2 Corinthians, chapters 10 through 13. But what we do know is this letter was very harsh, and it called this church to repent. He says, you need to get it in order. You need to act now. And Paul, again, he was very hurt. He sent this letter off with his good friend Titus, who was then to hand deliver it to the church in Corinth. And then Titus was to observe how they received that letter, and then Titus was to report back to Paul in, in uh, Troas as to everything that had taken place, if they had repented, if they had not repented. He was basically, Titus was the spokesman for Paul for that letter, the severe letter. So Paul sends Titus, he sends this severe letter, and the entire time while he is waiting for this letter to be returned, or the, uh, the results of this letter to be brought back to him, Paul is in Troas, and his heart and his mind is just racing. We're told that he had an open door to preach the gospel, but if you've ever been in that situation where you just have so much on your mind and you just cannot focus, and that is exactly where Paul was at. He was trying to do ministry. God had opened the door for the ministry to be performed, but Paul couldn't do it. He just, there was too much going on, too much stress. He, his heart raced. He was wondering, did this church harden their hearts or did they change? And guess what? Titus never showed up. Titus was supposed to meet him in Troas, but again, Titus, he's not there. So now Paul has this next stressor on him. All right, what happened to Titus? Did they kill him? 
Did they stone him and throw him out of the city? Did a crowd and a mob get him, a gang get him and beat him to the pulp? What, what happened? What happened to Titus? So Paul leaves Troas because he cannot focus and he goes to Macedonia, which is a, which is a province which is closer to Corinth. So he's hoping, okay, maybe I can just catch Titus there. It's a little bit closer and I just need to know what happened. I need to know what's going on. You see, Paul loved the Corinthians and he wanted nothing more than for them to be reconciled. But for reconciliation to take place, it took a stern rebuke. He knew that the truth needed to be spoken, even though it was risky. And he sent him this letter. How many of you have ever sent a letter and somebody who had hurt you or was in sin, maybe it was just a, just a bad situation, period, but you knew that you needed to write them a letter to get things squared away. Maybe it was a text or an email. And you were fully aware that it was risky to send that text or email. You didn't know how that was going to be received, but you wrote it still. You wrote that email. You wrote that text. And after you finished writing it, and it possibly had a rebuke in it or correction, and then afterwards you're just kind of staring at it on your phone, staring at it on your computer, and you're just like, okay, do I send this or do I not send this? I know I need to. I know I (laughs) want I really need to send this, but what if? What if? Your finger hovers over that button, and then after that dreaded time comes, and you hit it, send. And your heart continued to race because you wish you could take it back. Where is the unsend button? Have you ever been there? Seems like I'm there quite often, actually. But at the same time, you know that you needed to send it because there was much that needed to be said. See, confrontation, it can be difficult, can't it? And this is important to understand. Confronting sin and calling one another to repentance, this is at the heart of the process of sanctification in the life of the church. Listen, God uses believers to transform other believers. You know that? He uses us, our messiness. He uses us to form us and to mold us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses brothers and sisters in the faith to show us our shortcomings and our failures, to help us see our sin and our need for change. You see, the purpose of confrontation, the purpose of confrontation, the purpose of rebuke is to bring a person to repentance. Why? Because we love them. And if you love somebody, you want to see them healed, right? You want to see them restored. And loving confrontation demands that we willingly speak up when we see another believer in sin, when we see another believer in danger. We do this, again, not to grieve them, but to see them come to repentance and to be healed. That is the purpose of confrontation, That is the purpose of rebuke. We love people enough to tell them the truth so that they can be healed and restored. Amen? You see, this is where I believe Paul was at when he sent this letter. And having to send it to the Corinthians, it grieved him deeply. But now his heart was even more grieved because he didn't know if his friend, his beloved friend Titus, was dead or alive. It's compounded. There's a lot going on right here. So Paul, he waited in Macedonia He was severely distraught. Look again at verse 5. He says, For even when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were inflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. Now again, try to put yourself in Paul's shoes right here. He's exhausted from the pressures of the ministry. He's worn out by the opposition that he faced going against the gospel. He's experienced fears of death externally. He's having to deal with false teachers internally. Every corner, every avenue, he is just facing trials and tribulation. He's afflicted at every turn. And the daily pressures of the church, it constantly, they were constantly fighting at him, having to face the wolves who tried to distort the gospel. Paul says right here, he had no rest. His heart's in anguish. 
And on top of all this, he ached inside thinking about Titus. Listen, Paul had a lot to be depressed about. He couldn't escape it. Every turn brought him face to face with conflict. And again, have you ever felt that way? I've been there a few times, and it's not fun. It hurts. You enter a dark valley, maybe work or in the family circumstance, and it just seems like the clouds are never going to be lifted. You're just thinking to yourself, okay, Lord, I can handle this, but I'm barely handling this. I need, I need to breathe. But there's no reprieve. And the pressure seems insurmountable from all sides. It's just overwhelming. It's crushing. But the truth is, these are the times when God is most clearly seen working in our lives. You know that? Listen, God uses our times of difficulty to remind us of his love for us. He uses our time of trial when we're going through difficult trials and circumstances to to remind us that he's walking with us every step of the way for us to be dependent upon him. And how did God bring comfort to Paul in this situation? Look at verse 6. Paul's hurting, and God hears his cry. Verse 6, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that they rejoice still more. So Paul right here, he sees Titus coming towards him in that depression which once clouded him, and he was under so much just stress, it was lifted by seeing his friend. And I'm sure when Paul saw Titus, he probably smiled from ear to ear. First and foremost, just knowing that Titus was alive, that he was healthy, that nothing had happened to him. And because he was saved, Paul's joy, it welled. Listen, what gave Paul such comfort? He tells us in the first two words of verse 6. What does it say? The first two words, but God. But God, who comforts the downcast. He understood very well where that comfort came from. You see, God had revealed himself to Paul through the arrival of Titus. He used Titus to lift that burden, that depression. And I think there's an important teaching point right here as well. You see, God works through other believers to bring us comfort. When we're going through difficult trials, when we're going through difficult circumstances, a lot of times we're looking to heaven for, for the answers where God actually has that answer which comes right next to us through another Christian to walk with us through that difficult circumstance. He puts people in our lives at just the right time to pick us up when we're going through tough times. And for Paul, God used the arrival of Titus to lift him, to bring him out of the funk. But Paul had a second reason to rejoice. Yes, Titus was alive. He was doing well. But the report that he brought back from Corinth was an even greater cause for celebration. Listen, did the Corinthians receive Paul's severe letter well? And the answer is, yes, they did. We're given the result of it in verse 8. Look at verse 8. He says, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were, because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Listen, not only did the Corinthian church read Paul's letter, but they were so cut to the heart by Paul's words. The Holy Spirit hit them so hard that they repented. They took actions to make things right. They saw the error of their ways. They dealt with their sin. And they called these false apostles who had infiltrated the church, they called them to account. 
And Paul says, I rejoice, not simply because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. You changed. Praise God. Now, this is one of those Christianese terms that we have right here. And we hear it a lot. But yet very few people understand what the word really means. Repent. Repent. When we give the gospel, we call men and women to do what? Repent. But again, what does it mean? We see it throughout Scripture, specifically the New Testament. We hear people call, repent, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Matter of fact, Jesus himself preached this message. He said, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You go now to the establishment of the church at Pentecost. Peter, he stands up after being filled with the Holy Spirit of promise, and he gives the first sermon of the church. He tells of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ literally was a promised Messiah. He proved it through the Old Testament prophecy, showing exactly who he is. And as he spoke to this vast crowd, 3,000, at least 3,000 men, plus probably a crowd of about eight to 10,000 who he's preaching to, he preaches the gospel and he preaches it hard. And we were told by the time he gets done preaching that the people, they literally are cut to the heart. Matter of fact, Peter, he gives them an uppercut at the end. He says, this Jesus Christ whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, again, they were cut to the heart, and they said, Peter, what must we do to be saved? How did Peter respond? Oh, we know, because it's given to us in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said to them, what? Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was Peter's message? Repentance. That wasn't just a one-time thing. Matter of fact, he goes, to, he goes to Solomon's portico. He preaches the next message. What was his message? Well, we're told, repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Beloved, what was the, church, what was the message of the early church? Receive Jesus Christ through faith and repentance. And again, repent, it comes from the Greek metanoia. Meta means after. Noel means to understand. Literally means to have an afterthought or a change of mind. Now, some have tried to say that repentance is simply just that. It's just a mind change, and that's it. It's, it's simply believing a set of facts. If you have believed the facts about who Jesus Christ is, then somehow you've repented. But that is not how the Bible describes repentance, not at all. Matter of fact, it does a severe disjustice to the meaning of this word. You see, biblically speaking, repentance doesn't stop there. Metanoia in the New Testament, does in fact mean a change of mind, but it also and always speaks of a change of purpose, and specifically a turning from sin towards God. You once lived for the world, and now your will has been aligned with Christ's will, and you are living for who? For God. It's a heart that says, Lord, wherever you lead me, I will go. It's the heart of Isaiah that we have in Isaiah chapter 6. Here I am, Lord, send me. I'm yours. You are my Lord. You are my master. And I will serve you wholeheartedly. Now, someone might say, okay, Pastor Eddie, I know repentance is clearly seen in the gospel call. You cannot be saved without repentance. And the Bible makes that very clear. But wouldn't that make repentance a human work that must be done in order to be saved? Wouldn't that be adding works to the gospel of grace? Now, 
I will be the first to say that if our initial repentance was in fact something that we did in order to be saved, it would be a work because then you were in fact having to do something in order to be saved. Amen? It would be a work. And the Bible makes it extremely clear in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, by the works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight. No one. But understand, true biblical repentance is not a human work. You know why? Because of its source. Why do we repent? Because God gives us the ability to do so. Listen, I wouldn't ever choose to follow God unless God opened my heart and my eyes to reveal to me that I need to follow him. He's got to do a work within me in order for me to see my need and in order for me to turn and follow him, to make him Lord over my life. Matter of fact, Anthony Hokima, he defines repentance so well, I just figured I'd let him speak. He says, repentance may be defined as the conscious turning of the regenerate person away from sin and toward God in a complete change of living, which reveals itself in a new way of thinking, feeling, and willing. You see, when you heard the gospel of your salvation, when you heard it preached, what did God do? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. He opened your eyes to hear the gospel. He gave you faith to believe. Just as we are told in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Again, grace and faith are both what? They're gifts. They are given to us by God. He gives us faith to believe. He opens our eyes. He drops the blinders, the shingles from our eyes, the scales, whatever you want to call them. He allows us to see our need and to cry out to God. You see, God grants us the gift of faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then through that newly formed faith, he gives us the motivation. He gives us the power to turn away from our sin and to follow after him. You see, we will not turn away from sin and repentance until we understand something of the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just not going to do it. There's none who seek after God. No, not one. Rather, behind all true repentance is the grace of God coupled together with faith. Saving faith, enabling God to work in our lives. God redirects our human will to be conformed to his perfect will. Through faith, we see truth. Just as we're told in the book of Acts. Look what we're told in Acts. And here in Acts, we have slowly seen the progression. We've seen the Jews receive Jesus Christ at Pentecost. We've seen the Samaritans, which were half Jew, half Gentile. They received Jesus Christ. And then here in Acts chapter 11, we are given the account of how the Gentiles were brought in to the faith, how they were brought into the church. And Luke includes a very important detail in this narrative, which we can't pass over. And sometimes we just gloss over some of these things. But this is an important detail. Listen to what we're told in Acts chapter 11. When the Gentiles, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has what? Granted repentance that leads to life. Listen, what enabled these Gentiles to repent? God did. God did. He granted it. And don't miss what he's saying right here. He didn't simply allow it. That's not what this word means. We're told that he granted it. He gave them the ability to repent. Matter of fact, we're told the same thing by the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy. He writes, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Understand, repentance is a work of the Holy Spirit does within us. And again, it is interlinked with our faith. They go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. But if God is the one who grants repentance, again, who is the one doing the work? 
It's God. Initially, for our salvation, it is God. You see, true biblical repentance is a gift from God. Through faith, he convicts us of our sin. He shows us our need to confess and and forsake it. And then he empowers us to make this reality, to make it a reality in our lives through repentance. And again, I will say it again and again, faith and repentance are inseparable, hand in glove. They are the two links of a chain, the two links that bind the chain together of our salvation. Someone that says they have faith but have never repented, the Bible makes it clear they are still dead in their sins and their trespasses. You see, repentance is the grace of God working through the Holy Spirit in the heart of the person through faith. And that's exactly what we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. God opened the eyes of the Corinthians to see their need for change. And how do we know that this was true repentance? How do we know that it was a real deal? Because of how they responded. They read Paul's letter of rebuke. They were cut to the heart by the Spirit of God. And Paul specifies the type of grief that they felt. Look at verse 9 one more time. He says, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into what? Repenting. You changed. For you felt what? Godly grief. Godly grief, which leads to repentance. Listen, what was the proof that God was working in their hearts? They were confronted over their sin through the word of God, and they had a godly grief in response. And so we don't misconstrue what godly grief looks like. Paul goes on to tell us in verse 10. Listen to what he says. He gives us a good definition here. He says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Now, he gives us a contrast right here between the two different types of grief which we have, a godly grief and a worldly grief. For those who feel godly grief, the object of their grief is against the sin in their lives. Godly grief comes against the sin and it recognizes who God is and how that sin has affected their relationship with God, how they have hurt them, hurt him by their actions. In contrast, those who have a worldly grief, they're not primarily concerned about God's feelings. Rather, they're more concerned about how it affects them. It's all about themselves. Me, me, me. The object of his or her grief is the personal consequence of that sin. Matter of fact, Philip Hughes, he gives great insight to worldly grief. He writes, It is not sorrow because of the heinousness of sin and the rebellion against God, but sorrow because of the painful and unwelcome consequence of sin. Self is, the, self is its central point, and self is also the central point of sin. Thus, The sorrow of the world manifests itself in self-pity rather than in in contrition and turning to God for mercy. Matter of fact, I think a good example of worldly grief would be the actions of Cain in Genesis chapter 2. If you remember, he was out there and he was going to give his offering to God and his brother Abel was going to give his offering to the Lord. God accepted Abel's and not Cain's and Cain became angry at God. He became angry. What did he end up doing? He killed his brother. Now, initially, did he have any grief over his sin? Not at all. But then God confronts him. He calls him out. He's confronted. But what did he try to do? Right off the bat, he tries to minimize it. Am I my brother's keeper? You remember the story? He just kind of just minimizes everything, you know, like it's not a big deal. But once God announces his punishment for what he had done, well, at that point, then Cain's attitude starts to change, doesn't it? He was filled with what? Self-pity, sorrow. He cried out to the Lord, God, this is more than I can bear. How can you do this to me, sending me away? 
Listen, he was sad because he got caught and he had to suffer the consequences for his actions. It was a worldly sorrow. But now I want you to contrast his worldly sorrow with godly sorrow, which we see through the life of King David. Now, David, he was a man of God's own heart, but David did some pretty bad things in his life. He lusted after a married woman, Bathsheba. He took it a step further by committing adultery with her. And then in an effort to try and cover up his sin, he had her husband, Uriah the Hittite, put on the front lines of a battle, a very fierce battle, which he knew he would die, just so that he could kind of just put it under the rug and kind of get rid of it and pretend like that sin didn't exist. Over a period of time, sin literally had hard in David's heart. He became numb to it. But when David was confronted by the prophet Nathan and rebuked for what he had done, do you remember David's response? He cried out, and it wasn't about the consequence that affected him. He cried out, I have sinned against who? My God. Matter of fact, he would go on, if you want to read a really good psalm just about crying out to the Lord, read Psalm 51. This is what David would, would write and pray after that incident. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Beloved, what was David consumed with, himself or God? It was all about his God. The knowledge of his sin and how it had affected his relationship with the Lord. What was Cain filled with? Worldly sorrow. All he cared about was how his, how his sin affected him. Consider Judas Iscariot. He betrayed the Lord of glory for 30 pieces of silver, the price of an average slave. Yet we are told that when he was, after receiving the money and seeing what had happened and Jesus Christ being crucified, that he was so overwhelmed with grief and self-pity that rather than repenting and doing what was right, he chose instead just to go into a field and hang himself. Peter, on the other hand, he he betrayed Jesus not once, not twice, three times. He denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And he remembered Jesus' prophetic words that he just spoke hours earlier as he ran away and he wept bitterly. But we know that Peter's grief was a godly grief. Why? Because he confessed it. He confessed his sin. He went on to lead a fruitful life, a faithful ministry for the remainder of his years, literally going all the way to his death, serving the Lord. You see, this is important for us to understand. True biblical repentance will always lead to lasting change. That doesn't mean that we're not going to repeat that sin. That doesn't mean that we're not going to go through difficult times because we are. We are sinners saved by grace. But it means that there is a true progression of faith. We are continuing to, continuing to walk in the faith and we're growing day by day, repenting day by day. Or if I could put it another way, godly sorrow will always produce fruit in our lives starting with confession, seeing our sin as God sees it, learning to hate our sin as God hates it. And yes, God hates our sin. I think that should be one of our main prayers when we pray is, Lord, I know I don't see my sin in the proper light. Allow me to see it as you see it. Allow me to hate it as you hate it, to forsake it. Allow me to change. Beloved, if we are truly repentant, our hearts will ache over our sin and how we have hurt God. And though we will do this imperfectly, through faith, through that coupled faith, 
we will then strive to love, honor, and serve the Lord with all of our hearts that we can. And don't miss this. Genuine and complete repentance will always involve exercising faith. In faith, we choose to trust God's view of sin and what is right. In faith, we must wholly trust in his amazing grace, forgiveness, and love because of the cross, knowing that he who began that good work, in faith, he is going to continue it on. He is going to mold me. He is going to shape me. He is not done with me. He's going to continue on all the way to the end. And I know that. Why? Because I believe it because it says it. My faith and repentance, hand in hand. In faith, we wholly set our hopes and desires fully back on Christ and heaven. You see, true biblical repentance cannot be separated from our faith. I think I might have said that a few times this morning. And this is exactly what we see here in the Corinthian church. Look at verse 11. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in this manner. Now, right here, Paul has given us fruit. He is giving us true marks of biblical repentance. He lists sevenfold, a sevenfold rhetorical intensification of identifying marks of a truly repentant sinner. Those who have been filled with a godly sorrow. Look at verse 11 again. Let's break it down. Look at what he says here. Paul says that the Corinthians, first off, they're earnest. They saw their sinful actions for what they were, rebellious actions against God. So they confessed them and they forsook them. Listen, they saw how far they had fallen and they said, no more. I know that we were going this way. Hey, but we're now, we're with you, Paul. We are for God. We are going to walk with him every step of the way. They got serious about the one they served. Paul says that they were eager to clear themselves. You see, where the Corinthian church initially were apathetic as to their complicity against Paul, now they strove to prove their loyalty to him. He says, what indignation. Where they once put up with these false teachers who crept into the church, now they felt a righteous indignation towards them and also towards themselves for allowing such a thing to take place within the church. He says, what fear. I love that word, fear, phobos. That's where we get our word phobia. See, the Corinthian church's eyes were open to see who they were ultimately sinning against. It was God, the Holy One. And when they were able to see this, it turned them to Christ in reverential fear. He says next, what longing, literally earnest desire. These believers long to make things right between them and Paul, no matter what the cost. He says, what zeal, zealous. Again, they were passionate. They wanted to make things right. What punishment through the practice, practice of church discipline. They demonstrated their repentance by the willingness to deal with these false teachers in the church. And finally, after describing their sevenfold repentance, Paul then says, in a joyful celebration, at every point you have proven yourselves what? Innocent. Charges dropped. Case is clear. You see, like the Corinthian church, true biblical repentance is not merely being ashamed or sorry over your sin. It is a redirection of the human will. True repentance will cause us to act. To actively forsake all unrighteousness and then pursue righteousness. To seek reconciliation with God and others. You see, true repentance alters our entire character, our entire nature. This is a lengthy quote, but I thought it was really good, so I put it in. But listen to what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said. 
He says, repentance means that you realize you were guilty, vile sinners in the presence of God, that you deserve the wrath and the punishment of God, that you are hell-bound. It means that you begin to realize that this thing called sin is in you, that you long to get rid of it, and that you turn your backs on it in every shape and form. You renounce the world, whatever the cost, the world in its mind and its outlook, as well as as its practice. And you deny yourself and you take up the cross and you go after Christ. Your nearest and dearest and the whole world may call you a fool or say you have religious mania. You may have to suffer financially, but it makes no difference. That is repentance. You see, true biblical repentance is a call for us to see our sin for what it is. Wickedness and rebellion against our creator. And then discarding it from our lives, casting it as far away from us as we can, and then clinging to Christ and his righteousness to save us. Wholehearted devotion to live for him daily. Understand, it's not simply a mental activity, but it's a change that affects every area of my being. Because if my heart has been changed, my life is inevitably going to flow out of that new heart, right? We're new creations in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. And as I grow in my faith, the more that God reveals my sin within my life, the more that I need to repent. It's an onward. It's an ongoing thing. Repentance is a daily action that we must take. It's not a one-time act at our conversion. That's the initial. But from that point, we repent daily, turning to Christ, acknowledging our sin, hating our sin, confessing our sin, and forsaking our sin. You see, true biblical repentance, it's a lifelong work. It's a lifelong work. It initially takes place when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, which is all of God, Him doing the work to open our eyes. But this is also important to understand. It does not negate the human responsibility because we are held accountable, personally accountable to repent. Every single one of us. We are accountable for our actions. Understand, repentance is a progressive, lifelong work that we actively pursue through the power of God's Spirit. Some have described it as a synergistic effort, meaning that it's our responsibility after we are saved to continue on this path, coupled with God, who is making it a reality within our lives. And we do see this within Scripture. Matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, we're told this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, continue on the path of repentance. Continue just to strive for godliness, for holiness. That's the human side of the equation. But then Paul follows up in verse 13 with the God side of the equation. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Working both sides. Human responsibility the divine responsibility, working hand in hand as we go down this road of sanctification. Now, again, I think this is a good place to conclude because there's just so much here. But my question to you this morning is simply this. Seeing the biblical aspect, definition of of repentance Have you truly repented? And if you are a believer, are you repenting? Here are some good questions to ask yourself throughout the week. Do you think differently about God? Do you think differently about God? Do you see that God rather than you, must be at the center of your existence? Do you feel sorrow over your neglect of God? Are you growing in your understanding of his glory and worth? Do you see 
how beautiful and how marvelous and how wonderful he is, and he just becomes sweeter and greater day after day. Is the aim of your life to know him? How about your sin? Do you, do you see your sin as vile, revulsive, as an offense to God? Do you, do you see your sin as God sees it and hate it as he hates it? Do you feel regret and shame over your sin? Or do you minimize it? Do you have a true godly sorrow over your sin? Do you long to be free from the condemnation and bondage to your sin where we will finally be in heaven and finally free from just the weight of all this gunk that we have to deal with? Are you determined to confess your sin and to turn to God for mercy and cleansing? How about in the realm of your salvation? Do you fully agree that you cannot do anything to merit your salvation? That can only return to his presence through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you acknowledge that your best deeds, your best works are nothing more than filthy rags in his sight? Have you rejected all hope in your own righteousness? Cast it. Friends, if you are able to affirm these questions, and if these things are growing realities in your life, that doesn't mean you're living them perfectly because none of us are. But if they are growing realities in your life, it's a good indication that you are a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is doing a work in and through you right now conforming you to the image of his son. But if these things are not true in your life, and you can't give an affirmative answer to these things, continue to seek him. Pray to him for his mercy, to feel his mercy, to know his mercy and forgiveness. Continue to seek after God and his word and through prayer. Cry out to him for his grace, and draw near in his word until he has brought about this change in your heart. And no matter how long it takes, don't stop. Keep going. Keep going. Be persistent, like the persistent widow. You just keep going, and you keep going, and you keep fighting until he just makes that a reality. Maybe you're here this morning, and You are a true believer, but you have let certain sins take over in your life. The world may have stepped in and it's stolen your joy. The love and passion that you once felt for Christ, it's dwindled and you don't feel as close to him as you used to. Well, Jesus is calling out to you the same this morning. He gives us the same words that he gave the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. And again, it was written to the church. It was written to believers This is a plea to believers that we are told in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus speaks to the church and he says this, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. See, Jesus' point is simple right here. He loves you more than anything, more than you could ever imagine, and he desires to walk with you intimately, closely, daily. Come back to your first love. Confess your sins to him. Praise him for his faithfulness, for his goodness, knowing that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Worship him for the work that he has done for you on that cross. Take some time to really take inventory and to remember what it cost for you to be forgiven and made new. This is the 
first Sunday of the month, and we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper. And to take some time, again, just to bow your heads and confess your sins to the Lord and remember all that he has done for you. And maybe you need to do some repenting. I know that, well, I know we all do, bottom line. We all have things in our lives which we know we need to confess and forsake. I just want to ask you and ask the ushers to come forward, but just take this time and, and again, just praise God for his faithfulness and what he has done and how he has freed us from our bondage, our slavery to sin, but also to confess our sins for he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just worship him. Thank him. Oh, Father, we come before you. Your love is amazing. You've demonstrated your love for us that while we were sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. God becoming a man, living in the life that we are incapable of living perfectly, and in his perfect righteousness going to the cross on our behalf, wounded for our transgressions. We just stand in awe of you and what you have done for us, Lord. You have broken down the wall of separation, the barrier, the hostility that existed between us and you. You have made us new. You've done everything for us, Lord. All we can simply do is say thank you. And we do, we praise you. And I thank you so much for the love you have shown us, the mercy that you've shown us, the grace you have poured out upon our hearts, grace upon grace. We come before you this morning to remember the work of your son that he did for us on our behalf. His blood has washed us. It has saved us. And oh, we are just so indebted to you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We have been saved from hell. We have been give, given, granted life. Repentance. All comes from you and we praise you. We love you. We give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and we say, Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Can I have Tim come up? We're going to close in worship, and will you bow your heads with me? Can I also have the ushers come up, and we will take our offering. Father, again, thank you for the gifts you have bestowed upon us, spiritually, physically, financially. You've given us so much. We are so wealthy, Lord Jesus. We have every blessing in the heavenlies, and we are so blessed even just in our daily lives. And right now, we just come before you, and we just thank you so much for what you have provided for us, and we just give back to you just in a heart of gratitude for all that you have done. And again, to you be the glory. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing. i
since by faith I saw the stream by flowing wounds Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washing His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Father, we thank you again just 
that we have the ability, the opportunity, and the privilege to meet here each morning. The same goes for today. We thank you for um, this body. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that we've heard today. Lord, I pray that they would sink deep in our hearts and not just something that would go out of our minds as we leave this place, but that we would think on them throughout the week. Pray that you continue to grow your church. We thank you for all that you do for us, for all that you are. We thank you for your son and all that you've done through him for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.